Welcome back, Christian friends, to our continued study of Jesus as a theologian. And you will recall the fact that for our previous studies, we have been working on a very simple chart in which we have seen that God is reaching out in love, and not merely in love, but in costly, unexpected love. And we have seen that there are two kinds of people who are in need of this love, and that's people who keep the law and people who break it, and that pretty much covers everybody, the ins and the outs, the good guys and the bad guys, those who conform to society's requirements and those who don't. And that those who accept the offer of love, this acceptance is defined as repentance, and they are granted a new status that is called righteousness. They then respond in thanksgiving, and what they do in response is a thanksgiving for the love that they have received, not an attempt to earn goodies. So in the story which we will examine today, we will find love is offered and there is one lady who now begins to respond. So she is now already on third base of the running of our infield. And we'll find that she is caught in the midst of a circle of people who are law keepers And they're not on the ball field at all, at least not in its infield. They're out here looking at, we keep the law, we are the good guys, she doesn't, she's one of the bad guys, she's got to somehow make up for her sins and return to us through the keeping of the law. And they don't like the fact that she is already granted new status and is responding. And this is the story in Luke 7, starting in verse 37. If you have the sheet that goes with these studies, I trust that you will take it and follow along with us as we try to examine not only the form but also the content of this particular story. And so look, if you will, at that sheet for a minute and we'll look briefly at its structure and then try to unlock its theological content. The story begins with an introduction in which all three of the major Actors in the drama are indicated. There is the Pharisee, and there is Jesus, and the woman. And then we see the woman in this great dramatic action. This is the second scene. And in this action, she does three things. She brings, and she stands, and she weeps. But notice that even, I have translated the Greek text here very literally, if you don't have If you cannot read the words on your screen, perhaps you can follow them on the page. The first three are participles, bringing, standing, and weeping. Then the idea of weeping is completed. She wipes with her hair. Then the idea of standing by the feet is completed. She kisses the feet. Then the idea of bringing the alabaster flask of perfume is completed. She pours it out, and this is deliberate. The third scene is the little conversation with Simon. The fourth scene, which is the climax in the middle, is the parable. Parables are where you find them. And so in this case, we find the parable in the midst of this carefully structured dialogue and dramatic scene. And so then as we look at the second half of it briefly to see its form, there is then a second dialogue with Simon Jesus then begins to describe the actions of the woman. She hasn't said a single word. And then finally, we return to see where the major three characters of the story have finally come out. You can then follow this on your sheet as we proceed to examine the story one scene at a time. Again, there are seven scenes. Scene one is the bringing of all the characters on stage. Scene two is the dramatic action of the woman. Scene three is the, para- the, the conversation with Simon. Scene four is the, dial- is the parable. 
Then we have another conversation with Simon. Then Jesus explains the woman's action. And finally, we go back to see, seeing where the major characters are at the end of this incredibly dramatic scene. All right, let's now move through it and see what the story is saying to us when we try to look at it in the context of the culture of the Middle East. First of all, it says one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. We talked earlier in this series about the haburim, the religious clubs that scholars formed. You could only get in, get in by being recommended by two other members, and you were expected to be a very pious person who spent your life trying to understand the law, aside from the hours you spent on your profession. So it's pretty clear from this particular scene that Jesus has proclaimed his message in that village, and then the religious club says, we want to talk to you. Because it's pretty obvious that, as he always apparently did, he has proclaimed the freely offered love of God in unmerited favor, which we call grace. And in the audience were two kinds of people. One kind was these Pharisees, the members of the religious club, who are very upset because he is now fracturing their understanding of religious duty before God as fulfilled by law. And there was a woman there who was an immoral woman. Now, this woman, imagine her situation. She's been told all her life, dearie, you can't possibly repent until you make up for all your sins. Given her particular lifestyle, compensation for all that she has done and all the lives that she has messed up is not possible. And so thereby, repentance for her is out of the question. Suddenly, someone comes to town, this new rabbi called Jesus from Nazareth, and he says, that isn't the way God acts. God breaks into our lives in a costly demonstration of love, and we are called upon to accept it. And in that acceptance, we are granted status in his presence. We are then required to respond. But we respond not in order that he might show love to us, but we respond in gratitude for the love we have already received. All right, so this means it's now possible that the burden of guilt upon her back can be removed. And so she wants to press in and to offer a gesture of gratitude to the agent of this love. So we are told, and she learned, quote, he is dining in the Pharisee's house, unquote. We don't have time to go into the technical aspects of Greek grammar here, but there is a word in Greek that is the word hati, which means either direct or indirect speech. And this particular sentence has no verb to be. Some of our translators have decided that it's in the past, and they've decided it's indirect speech. And so they've translated it, she learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. You see, it's already in the past, he's already there, and now she comes afterwards. But you see, if you read it that way, then we have a problem, because Jesus, when he starts describing this act, says, from the moment I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. So Jesus says, she's already there when I show up. Well, now, how can we reconcile the text with itself? Very simply, if we realize that there isn't any verb to be, and that this little word hati is meant to be introducing direct speech, she learned, quote, he is dining in the Pharisee's house, by which we mean she's asking who's going to entertain the guest. She's told Simon is, and so she rushes along with the crowd to enter the house of Simon. As Jesus rushes in, she also rushes in. Now, this is in keeping with traditional banquets in traditional society. The honored guests will be reclining on couches. They don't recline on couches now, but we do know from the archaeology of first century Palestine that middle class homes in Palestine did recline on couches in the Greco-Roman style. 
and then the humbler people of the village would be seated, probably crouching against the wall, in the ring around them. They'll probably be fed, but they will be fed later. And all of this fits the story. There's no such thing in the Middle East as we're going to have 12 people and so we set, tw we set 12 places. No, you're supposed to have three times as much food as anybody can eat. The door is open. Whoever wanders in will be fed. So she's there when he comes in. Now, when he comes in, something very amazing happens. And that is that all of the traditional courtesies that are ordinarily extended to any guest, and particularly to an honored guest, are omitted. If a rabbi comes to visit you, you're supposed to, if you are a fellow rabbi of equal rank, kiss him on the face. If you are his student, you kiss him on the hand. If you are his servant, you kiss him on the feet. Judas certainly kissed our Lord's hand in the garden. Sorry about all those medieval paintings. There's no way he could have kissed him on the face because this would have meant to assert that he is an equal rabbi of equal stature to our Lord. The prodigal son would have kissed his father on the feet, but the father interrupts him and kisses him on the neck, stopping him from becoming a servant, which is what he has in mind, as we saw in our previous studies. So, and then the next thing, of course, is they wash his feet, and then someone offers him probably uh, some olive oil with which to freshen up uh, his, his head and his hands, which is a custom that was uh, carried through clear into the 19th century. Some of my missionary colleagues in Lebanon in the 19th century had this custom still alive and enacted to them as they vi visited village scenes in the mountains of Lebanon, as I have established from these documents. So all of this is omitted. Now, mind you, every culture has ways, conscious or unconscious, of welcoming a guest. We have them. Somebody comes to the door and you say, oh, hello, Joe. Wouldn't you like to come in? Can I take your coat? Wouldn't you like to sit down? Four things. Glad to see you. Won't you come in? Can't I take your coat? Wouldn't you like to sit down? Now, what if Joe shows up to his friend's house and the friend opens the door and says, Oh, it's you. Silence. Well, you see, good old Joe is going to very quickly get the point. The traditional courtesies are omitted. All right. What this woman witnesses as she enters the house with Jesus, or perhaps she's there before he arrives, is the put-down. And she is horrified because this beautiful person who finally lifted from her back this incredible weight of having to make up for all her sins, which she knows given her particular lifestyle is not going to be possible, which she has been told is required of her if she is going to repent, this person who told her that God loves sinners even like her is now being offended. He's being put down. He's being publicly insulted. They expect with a few tight-lipped remarks, he will say, it's obvious I'm not welcome here, and he will stomp out and they will have won the face down against this whippersnapper who's going to revise our traditional theological attitudes. But Jesus absorbs the hostility. Indeed, he was able to absorb enormous hostilities, and in the absorption of hostilities, they died. And at the cross, he absorbed the hostilities of the sin of the world, and in the absorption of it, it died. And a part of the meaning of the redemptive power of the cross is in that absorption of hostilities. Somebody doesn't throw it back. It comes like a great stone thrown into a, into a quiet pond, and the water absorbs the motion of that stone and does not react by throwing like a spring-like action in response again. So she's ready to anoint his feet 
after the host washes them. She is not prepared to wash them. But this put-down triggers in her being a response beyond that for which she was prepared. She begins to weep. She is really upset over what they're doing to him. She has no towel, and so she undoes her hair and begins to wipe his feet. She then takes her flask, her alabaster flask of perfume, and pours it out. It doesn't take very much imagination to figure out why a woman of her particular profession would need an alabaster flask of perfume. And so it is an enormously beautiful and tender gesture to see her pouring that out and thereby saying, I'm not going to need the tools of my trade again. She is making a statement about the nature of the new lifestyle which she intends to fulfill on the basis of a new relationship offered to her in a costly act of love. Now, the bit about the hair is even more critical. In the Middle East, a woman's hair is considered very private, and to expose the hair is considered an act of self-revelation on a very deep level. And this is why in Iran today, the new conservative regime of Khomeini insists that the woman's hair must be covered. And indeed, in first century Palestine, any Jewish woman who allowed her hair to be seen by any man other than her husband could be divorced. If you saw the movie that came out some years ago called Zorba the Greek, you remember that in that story, there is a lady in a Greek village, not a Semitic village, but the custom apparently is the same, and at one critical point, she lets her hair down. And this is just before she's going to get in bed with the hero of the story. And so to, to expose the hair is what a woman does only to her husband, and there are definite and clear sexual overtones to the revelation of the hair. Mind you, a part of this has come across in English. I've never been able to figure out how or when, but we say so-and-so let his hair hair down. Now, some of us would have a very hard time doing that. But to let someone to let his hair down, for us in Western idiomatic speech, means self-revelation. All right, that comes out of classical Middle Eastern, both Greek and Semitic culture. This woman is now letting her hair down, and everybody is going to be aghast. The party is getting out of hand. All right. Simon now has got Jesus under the glass. He's turning the dials on that microscope to try and figure out whether this fellow is a true prophet or not. What is a true prophet in his mind? A true prophet is somebody who knows who those blankety-blank sinners are and has nothing to do with them. A prophet for him is not somebody who re reaches out in a gesture of costly love to those in need. And so we start to see something about the mentality of Simon by the very things he says. Jesus is brought here for an examination, and now we know he's not a true prophet because he would have known, says Simon, what sort of a woman this is who is touching him. The word to touch in Greek means both to touch physically, it also means to light a fire, and the word to touch in Semitic speech is the word used for the marital relationship. We would have to translate this, who is sexually fondling him. Why doesn't he stop this ghastly scene? Why doesn't he say, look, dearie, you're upset. Why don't we talk later? Okay, why doesn't Jesus do that? Why does he let this scene continue? Knowing perfectly well exactly what is going through the mind of that circle of self-righteous Pharisees sitting around him. They are going to despise him for this. The very acceptance of that gesture of thankfulness on her part is the process of the continued healing of her soul. And if she re gets rejection now, what's it going to do to her? 
Jesus knows the price that she is paying to offer this gesture of love. And so he is willing to make this passive offer of love to her by the acceptance of the thankfulness which she brings. He knows what's going through Simon's mind. And then he says, Simon, I've got something to say to you. Now, this is an idiomatic phrase in our Middle Eastern speech, and it's a very strong phrase. Whenever in public you say to somebody, Ya fulan, and andi kilimatin ilak, so and so, I've got something I want to say to you. It means you sit down and you hold on to your chair and you can listen to me and you're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you and I'm going to tell you in public because you need to hear it. So everybody braces themselves after this introductory phrase for what's going to come. Now, what comes? A very simple little parable. We know the parable, and the parable says somebody owes so much, 50 denarii, somebody 500. Both of them are forgiven freely. Now, who is going to respond with greater love? And so we come back after the parable to Simon in the second dialogue. This is now scene five. The themes are starting to repeat, as you can see from the way we've typed the inversion on the page in front of you. And Simon is asked, who is going to respond with greater love? The one who responds with, who has little forgiveness or the one who has been forgiven much? And he says, well, I suppose it's the guy to whom much is forgiven. And then Jesus says to him, you have judged rightly. Then he really gives it to him. Now, what do we mean by that? He starts off and says to him, Simon, do you see this woman? And then he says, Simon, I entered your house. Now, this is one Middle Easterner talking to another, and he's saying to him, Simon, you and I know the responsibilities of the host in our culture to the guests. We are not sitting in a public place, Simon. I entered your house. He doesn't have to say it in that tone of voice because everybody knows that the words have got the ring of cold steel. He doesn't say to Simon, oh, come on, Simon, don't be too hard on this poor woman. And by the way, how was it that Simon knew who she was? I don't think Simon is necessarily sleeping with her. But Simon knows that, well, boys will be boys, and yes, there's a few girls in the village. And Simon has just said to himself, this man is not a prophet, for she, he would have known what kind of a woman she is, for she is a sinner, not she was a sinner. Her repentance is not accepted by Simon. Jesus is leaving town. How can he break some kind of a crack into that self-righteous society that there might be room for the authenticity of this woman's repentance. What kind of a place is she going to have if that crack isn't going to be made? And so he picks up a great big hammer and he tries to crack that self-righteousness that room for her might be made. And how does he do it? He attacks the quality of hospitality extended to him. Now, I've been trying, even with American audiences, for about 10 years to try and find somebody who found a scene similar to this in our own Western society, in which some honored guest turned and attacked the quality of hospitality extended to them. We do it in jest. You know, they bring you out steaks about this thick, and then you say, well, Jane, it's too bad you didn't have any meat tonight. You mean the other way around. You mean this meat is fantastic. Now, I've, offered, I've been offered a few meals in which I felt like saying this. You know, the paper plates were soggy, and the potato chips were crumbly, and the, uh, and the hot dogs were cold. And I felt like, well, you know, I really was expecting something a little more. But I never said it. Now, if that's true in our culture, what about the Middle Eastern culture with all of its rules and requirements of hospitality and all the extent to which the gracious host is the most important principle of your own self-esteem? Now Jesus starts saying, Simon, you blow it. 
And this woman is making up for your mistakes. And you're shouting at her. You've got to be kidding. What does he say? He says, you never gave me any water for my feet. Now, he doesn't say, you didn't wash my feet. That would have been too much. He says, you didn't even give me the water. I'd have washed them myself. And there's no way in which Simon can escape and say, who does this guy think we are? Are we his servants? No, no. No way to escape. Then he says, you gave me no kiss. Jesus doesn't say to him, you didn't kiss my face or you didn't kiss my hand. He doesn't suggest what Simon should have kissed. He says, you didn't kiss me at all. This woman not only has kissed me, but she has kissed my feet. And you didn't anoint my head with the simple olive oil that is the central ingredient of the kitchen of every Palestinian home. But this woman, not my head and not with oil, but my feet with perfume has poured it out. She, Simon, has been compensating for your mistakes. And if I am going to avoid a great sinner, Simon, I'm going to have to avoid you and not her. And what is the point? The point is, Simon, you too are a great sinner, and I've just pointed out some of your sins, your self-righteousness in regard to her, amongst other things, your failure in your responsibility to me, your inability to see the reality of this tender and beautiful scene, your self-righteousness, which has become a set of dark glasses through which you look at the one who's broken the law, having prided yourself on having keep it, ha- being one who keeps it. All of these things he's now being accused of, and who is under the glass. Very quickly, the tables are turned, and Simon, who brought Jesus to put him under the glass, now suddenly Simon is under the glass. And how does the story end? There's one little mistranslation here that finally is corrected now in the New English Bible and in the Jerusalem Bible, one done by Protestant scholars, the other done by Roman Catholic scholars. The little phrase, for she loved much can now be translated therefore she loved much mind you if you put in for she loved much then we've got an incredible problem right there in the text for then it has to read her sins which are many have been forgiven for she loved much that is she came in and showed me all of this love and i liked it and I'm rewarding her with forgiveness. But that's not what the parable says. The parable says the forgiveness is first, and the response in love is second. Sorry, yes, the forgiveness is first, and the response of gratitude comes second. And that's the way the story ends. He who is forgiven little, you see, the forgiveness is first, then the response of love comes second. If you take that little phrase for, and you just write, therefore, which we now know is a, legitimate, on the, is a legitimate translation on the basis of how this, these Greek words represented uh, Semitic meanings, which is, as I say, incorporated both into the English, New English Bible and the Jerusalem Bible, the whole thing is straightened out. Her sins have been already forgiven. Therefore, in response, she loves much. And so thereby we find that this woman heard the message of the love offered to her. She accepted the forgiveness offered in that love. She is now responding. And responding to whom? Jesus does not say to her, Dearie, you have received the forgiveness of God. Wonderful. Why don't you go to Jerusalem and offer a thank offering there in the temple area because God is the one who forgives your sins? No. Jesus is the unique agent of God who mediates forgiveness and accepts in his person the response. He is the one to whom a response of love is appropriately expressed. And Simon is blamed because he's not offering that response of love to Jesus. We call this in technical language functional Christology. We discover who Jesus is in this story not from the titles. There are no titles except the word teacher, which is Luke's word for rabbi. But we discover who he is from what he does, 
as Middle Easterners have always done. And so we find two kinds of sinners, and the one who breaks the law accepts the love of God and responds in thankfulness, and the one who keeps the law has not responded and is resentful that the love has been offered to someone else. And we see our Lord offering a costly demonstration to a woman who is looked upon as a pattern of faith for the self-righteous Pharisees. Indeed, the theology of Jesus comes again, both in story, in dramatic act, in metaphor, and in example, brilliantly clear for all of us. Amen.